Hushkit presents the top 11 jump jets. Runways and large air bases are undesirable locations for military aircraft. Being tied to miles of concrete at a known location gives jet aircraft a built-in vulnerability. An air base is a priority target in a war. At sea, conventional aircraft require massive, hugely expensive aircraft carriers and carrier operations are notoriously dangerous, requiring a great deal of pilot skill. If an aircraft could be made that could take off and land vertically, it would be far more flexible, operating from small ships and forward operating bases, and able to fight on when all air bases had been destroyed. With this in mind, aircraft manufacturers across the world began work on military jump jets. These almost inevitably doomed projects have put some fascinating shapes into the sky. VFW VAC 191B, the German Kestrel. Nazi Germany experimented with a vertical takeoff rocket powered fighter in the 1940s, the Backham BA 349, but the only manned vertical takeoff resulted in the death of the pilot. Wartime Germany was also working on a kind of proto-Osprey, the Focke Aggeles FA-269 tilt rotor. Following the end of the war, interest in military VTOL aircraft continued in the new West Germany, with all the major manufacturers offering concepts. As with several aircraft on this list, the £192 million BAC 191 project was built in an attempt to create a low-altitude nuclear strike fighter. The propulsion system, developed with the help of Rolls-Royce, used a Rolls-Royce MAN Turbo RB193, similar to the Pegasus engine in concept, and two lift jets. When the NATO requirement was scrapped, after being technically won by the Hawker P1154, the VAC-191 flew on in support of an ambitious US-West German fighter project. When this project was also canned, it was hard to justify, and the VAC-191 was axed by the West German government in 1972. Ryan X-13 Vertijet, the Pentagon Easy Chair. One approach to sole vertical takeoff and landing was the tail sitter. A tail sitter can take off and land vertically, but this comes at a cost for both pilot and airframe. The pilot must get into a very high cockpit and take off and land with a very restricted view. The pilot must also master an unusual transition from vertical to horizontal flight. For the aircraft, great aerodynamic compromises must be made. In most cases, tail sitters also require a special launch rig. The X-13 was built to demonstrate the practicality of the jet tail sitter to the US Air Force. Intriguingly, pitch and yaw were controlled in the hover by the use of vectored thrust. The X-13 was developed from earlier efforts by Ryan to produce a submarine-launched aircraft for the Navy. The jet-powered X-13 was more successful than turboprop tail sitters, but it was still championing the wrong approach. In an attempt to promote the aircraft, the X-13 once landed at the Pentagon. Like the British English Electric Lightning and Hawker Hunter and the Swedish Draken, it was powered by a Rolls-Royce Avon engine. The Lockheed XV-4 Hummingbird, Bumbly Chancer. This is probably the worst aircraft on this list in terms of its effectiveness. Vertical lift came from the thrust being vectored downward through multiple nozzles. But the thrust generated was far less than expected, a factor which contributed to both XV-4s crashing. The Yakovlev Yak-38, the Black Sea Harrier. The Soviet Union never bought into the massive US-style aircraft carrier idea. They did, however, have cruiser carriers operating the Yak-38. This Sea Harrier equivalent, though slightly earlier than the British aircraft, served the Soviet Navy from 1976 to 1991. 
It was inferior in almost every way to the Sea Harrier, notably in payload and range performance, which was pitiful. But in relative terms, it was actually a larger step forward, as the Soviet Union had previously almost no experience of fixed-wing aircraft carrier operations. The Yak had one main engine with two vectoring nozzles and two dedicated lift engines. Control in the hover came from some of the thrust from the main engine being diverted to reactor jets in the extremities of the aircraft. The Yak went to Afghanistan for combat trials in around 1980, and thus the Forger, as it was known to NATO, became the first jump jet to operate in a combat zone. Though much maligned, the Yak-38 was only intended as an interim aircraft and shouldn't be judged too harshly. It also laid the foundation for the fast, agile and considerably more impressive Yak-41, a technology demonstrator for the remarkable but doomed Yak-43. Ryan XV-5A, the man-eater. The perky little Ryan XV-5A was built to answer the US Army's need for a close support aircraft. Attempts to develop a combat rescue capability were not encouraging. In trials, a dummy was ingested in one of the wing fans. The use of a lift fan for vertical flight is an idea that's still alive today and can be seen on the F-35B. The Dornier DO-31, Jimbo the Ketamin Jet. The superbly bonkers DO-31 transport was conceived to support the dispersal of a planned NATO supersonic fighter. Yes, that same one. Its tremendous thrust came from eight lift engines and two Pegasus Harrier engines. The drag and weight imposed by the wingtip mounted engine pods was a big issue and the performance was disappointing. The aircraft had a fantastic appearance, however. The EWR VJ101, the Manga Starfighter. West Germany wanted a replacement for the Starfighter in the interceptor role. The extremely demanding requirement called for a top speed of Mach 2.5, a 72,000 feet ceiling, and a time to 65,000 feet of 90 seconds. Heinkel and Messerschmitt teamed up with a rather less famous Bulkov to produce this six-engine tribute to the aesthetics of Roger Ramjet. Unlike other aircraft featuring small jets, this did not feature a larger main engine. The design, which in many ways was similar to the never-completed Bell XF-109, achieved a speed of Mach 104 without afterburner. This was the first time the sand barrier was broken by a vertical takeoff aircraft. On the 14th of September 1964, a defect in the autopilot caused the 101X1 to crash and it sustained serious damage. There was also some serious design issues. Among them, the afterburner's tendency to scorch the runway and burn the side of the aircraft with hot gases. The Dassault Mirage 3V sought Mirage. Without a doubt, the best looking and fastest jump jet to fly was the French Mirage 3V. This prototype fighter, based on the basic layout of the Mirage 3, first flew in 1965 in an attempt to win that same NATO Basic Military Requirement 3 for a common supersonic VTOL fighter. The prototype achieved Mach 204, but could not fly supersonically after a vertical takeoff as it could not carry enough fuel. The Mirage 3V was lifted by a bank of eight lift jets, the weight and complexity of which would have limited the aircraft's practicality had it ever entered service, which it didn't. The Lockheed Martin F-35B Lightning II, the prolapsing firefly. The 
Though symbolic of all that is awful about the military-industrial complex, the F-35B is a very impressive piece of engineering. The aircraft is the first supersonic jump jet to enter service. This is a greatly impressive feat, following more than 50 years of failed attempts by some of the world's greatest designers to do the same thing. The vertical takeoff of the aircraft is a fascinating event to watch and was described somewhat distastefully by one observer as looking like a prolapsing firefly. The F-35's propulsion system is heavily influenced by the Yakovlev Yak-41, but the articulated nozzle also bears a striking resemblance to that of the cancelled German VJ-101E. The Yakovlev Yak-41 Perestroika Carpet Burn the abortive Yak-41 was an ambitious attempt to produce a supersonic VTOL carrier fighter for defence of the Soviet naval fleet. The project began in the mid-1970s and a prototype flew in 1987. In an unusual and at the time secretive move, Lockheed funded the project to gain propulsion experience for the X-35, forerunner to the F-35. The Yak 41 used a similar propulsion system to the F-35 with a swivelling main nozzle, but differed in having two lift engines. The F-35 opted for a lift fan powered by the main engine. This impressive manoeuvrable aircraft achieved 12 FAI records in April 1991. Its timing was unfortunate, arriving as the Soviet Union was disintegrating and it was cancelled in 1992. Vertical takeoff required the use of reheat, which necessitated special steel decks. Number one, the Harrier, the four poster death trap. No surprises here for the number one spot. The Harrier was based on a French propulsion concept, mastered by the British and then refined by the Americans. Key to the Harrier's success is the simplicity. The engine's thrust is steered through four movable nozzles with small reactor jets to aid steering in the hover. Unlike rival concepts, the wing and engine did not need to be swiveled for vertical flight, nor did it depend on extra lift engines, which were a weight burden in forward flight, or a specialized landing pad. The Harrier was a lower risk brother to the aborted P1154, initially funded in part by the US Army, which was keen to develop an in-house fixed-wing close support force, and partly privately, as British companies were then prohibited from developing manned military aircraft, as they were deemed obsolete. The first-generation Harrier entered service with the Royal Air Force on April Fool's Day 1969, and remained in service until early 2016 in Sea Harrier guise, with the Indian Navy. The Harrier and Sea Harrier were blooded in the UK's 1982 war with Argentina, where it operated in atrocious weather conditions. The Sea Harrier was undefeated in air-to-air -air combat against faster Mirages and derivatives and Skyhawks. From the late 1980s, the Harrier was replaced by the bigger and more sophisticated Anglo-American Harrier II. During operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, 86 AV-8Bs, the American Harrier II, amassed over 3,000 flights and over 4,000 flight hours, with a mission availability rate of over 90%. Five aircraft were lost to enemy surface-to-air missiles, and two US Marine Corps pilots were killed. U.S. Army General Norman Schwarzkopf later included the AV-8B among the seven key weapon systems of the war. As well as Iraq, the Harrier fought above Kosovo, Afghanistan and Libya. The Harrier, especially in its initial form, had a very high attrition rate for an aircraft of its generation. 40% of all Harriers were lost in accidents and it was difficult for pilots to master. Landing was particularly hard, with the pilot having to control both the throttle and the nozzle lever with his left hand.
Today, the Harrier remains in service with the forces of the US, Spain and Italy. In the future, when the Harrier is gone, its legacy will be seen in the shape of every F-35. The US Marine Corps and British requirement for vertical takeoff has given all the members of the Lightning family their distinctive dumpy appearance. Mm -hmm.